Good afternoon, everybody. And many thanks to all of you for joining us in somewhat different circumstances to the ones we originally envisioned. My name is Edward Tyman. I'm an associate professor in the Slavic department here at UC Berkeley. Um, we have moved our event today with Hamid Ismailov to an entirely online event, for which I want to thank, uh, first of all, our guest uh, for his patience um, and also everyone else involved in making this happen, especially the Berkeley AV team. And I also want to thank at the beginning of this event today, um, the Institute for Slavic, East European and Eurasian Studies, the Institute of East Asian Studies, um, and the Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures for co-sponsoring this event. We are deeply honored to host today uh, Hamid Ismailov, um, a writer and journalist and a major figure in contemporary world literature. Born in 1954 in the Kyrgyz Soviet Socialist Republic, Ismailov was forced to flee his home in Uzbekistan soon after its independence from the Soviet Union due to what the state dubbed unacceptable democratic tendencies. He moved to the United Kingdom where he worked for 25 years uh, for the BBC World Service, including for a time as its first writer in residence. At present, Ismailov is Regional Director for Central Asia at Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. Ismailov's prolific output includes numerous works of poetry and prose in both Uzbek and Russian. Translations into English include The Railway, The Underground, The Dead Lake, and A Poet and Bin Laden. His novel, The Devil's Dance, won the 2019 EBRD Literature Prize for the best work of fiction translated into English. And his newest work, Manashi, was published last year in a translation from Uzbek by Donald Rayfield. Ismail's work combines a profound commitment to history and a remarkable dexterity in moving across cultural canons with a restless exploration of new forms, styles, and voices. The setting for much of his writing is Central Asia, which emerges from these books as a multicultural, multilinguistic space whose modernity has been shaped by overlapping and conflicting cultural currents, Islamic, Turkic, Persian, Russian, and Soviet. The modern and the pre-modern interweave and coexist. History, myth, folklore, and religious experience sit alongside accounts of Soviet modernization and its often catastrophic consequences, or dark tales of post-Soviet, post-colonial experience. We came up with the title for this event, Readings with Strangers, based on our sense that Ismailov's writing returns again and again to questions of in-betweenness, the spaces between fixed and immutable identity formations, between languages, between cultures, between times. There is a call in his writing to open ourselves up to strangeness and otherness in a way that is not just aesthetic, but also, I think, ethical. So we will begin today's event with a reading um, from Hamid Ismailov himself, um, a reading of the story, The Stone Guest, uh, for which I will offer a brief synopsis before Hamid reads, uh, since he'll only be reading sections from the story. Um, he will read a segment first in Uzbek and then uh, the, um, some selections in English. Um, then Harsha Rahman and I will ask a few preliminary questions to get our discussion going, um, but we will also invite you watching on YouTube to submit your questions through the chat function uh, on the right side of the page and our online moderator Sophie Lockie will be reading your questions and introducing them into our conversation. So as I said, I will preface Hamid's reading with a short synopsis of the story The Stone Guest. Um, which will be read in the wonderful English translation of Shelley Fairweather Vega. Uh, and Sophie, um, I will ask to drop a link to the story online in the chat so that those um, following along uh, virtually may, uh, may read along as, as Hamid is reading if they wish. So in this story, um, Surab Surat Aliyev, a respected sculptor born in Uzbekistan, uh, has lived in and worked in Moscow for over 40 years, long enough that his Uzbek has become rusty. One day, a distant relative from his, from his village, Sangin, calls out of the blue. He and a friend have been arrested by federal migration services for not having the correct papers. So Rob takes the two young men in, puts them up in his studio, which they track. Then he kicks them out, giving them two woolen sweaters and $200 on condition that they return home. Later that day, they extract more money from him, claiming they need more than what he gave them to buy train tickets. They then demand more again for plane tickets. And while handling, handing over this third sum of money, Sarov found, finds himself forced to bribe a police officer who accuses him of drug smuggling. Now, the ending of the story, I think I will leave 
unsaid since Hamid will be reading from the end. Hamid, over to you. Thank you, Edward, uh, for your introduction and for your warm words about uh, my work and about myself. I'm really honored uh, to be in front, uh, though virtually, in front of your students, in front of your uh, colleagues and uh, that audience, which uh, maybe uh, will be joining us from uh, different places, not just uh, Berkeley University, but maybe from other places as well. I'm really honored and uh, pleased uh, to meet all of you. So let's start with the, the Uzbek, just to give a feeling of the text, first in Uzbek, and then I'll read some excerpts in English. Sangin Mehmon, Shrop Suratalif, Nudus Lara Hazel Laship, Uzurat Seretelli, Dep Atashata. Shrop Chindanham, Haikal Tarosh, Yeseda, Ammo, Zurab Seretelli Cab, Itu Bitka Tanishemas. Balki Moskva san'at davralarida o'ziga xos zodagonlar dahosi sharafiga ega edi. Uning Moskvaga kelganiga ham biror 40-45 yil bo'lib qolgan. Shuning uchun o'zini ba'zan Anjanning ko'tanarig'idan emas, balki mana shu poytaxtda tug'ilib, mana shu yerda shu yerning loyini olingan haykalga o'xshatardi. Nozik san'atlarning bari qo'shib chatish, to'qish haqida emasmi? Faqat haykaltaroshlik buyuk Michelangelo'ning ta'biricha ayirish ajratishga qurilgan. Haykal yasash bu shaklsiz bir bo'lak moddadan keraksiz qismini ayirib ajratib tashlashdir. That is the feeling uh, of how the story goes in Uzbek. Let me read some excerpts, uh, excerpts in English. Sukhrab Suratalif's friends uh, used to tease him by calling him Zurab Tsereteli. Uh, Sukhrab was a sculptor by trade, but he was somewhat less of a household name than the popular Tsereteli, whose oversized monuments loomed over so many Moscow squares. Our sculptor Sukhrab instead uh, was a serious artist and quite well respected among the elite of the Moscow's arts community. It had been 40 or more years since Sukhrab had come to Moscow, so he often imagined he was a child of this metropolis, forgetting that he had in fact been born on the banks of Andijan's fetid Kutan Canal in provincial Uzbekistan. He felt as if the clay of his own statue, so to speak, had been gathered from this land, not that one. Virtually all fine art is premised on building and adding on. But the art of sculpture, as the great sculptor Michelangelo taught, consists of nothing but carving out and than discarding. Than the popular he once famously said that his David has always been there in the marble. Uh, and his job was solely to chip away everything unnecessary. Step by step, I think that kind of habit work, works its way uh, into you. These carving out and discarding seems to seep into your very life, and you start to look at everything from this point of view with a critical eye. What is empty or incidental or useless has no place in your heart, and you find yourself always striving to reach the essence of the things, the stone at the center, the very core of things. Well, some people are just built that way, aren't they? Our Sukhrop took that approach, and because of that, some of his acquaintances would have characterized him as an arrogant, crude man, while only those very few close to him knew that uh, that was only true superficially. But come with me, please, and let's take a closer look ourselves, remaining faithful to Michelangelo's rule within this story of ours. We will shun the uh, useless side roads and delve straight into the heart of the matter. Recently, aside from all the other immigrants here, poverty-stricken Uzbeks and Tajiks, Kyrgyz and Azeris have been leaving their hopelessly poor homelands and converging in odds on Moscow. Back to Soviet times, you would have found them only out at Kazan station or the big exhibition grounds where they Nha. Uh, on the outskirts of the city. But one time back then, during intermission at the Kremlin Valley, Sukhrab spotted a collective farm worker, a real hick from the sticks. 
uh, cons uh, conspicuous among the crowd, and the sight of him cast uh, Sukhrop the sculpture far into that night, deep into a state of shock. He was so overwhelmed by feeling that he was moved to create his masterpiece, the Girya, his very own Uzbek Pieta. In that sculpture over a Jesus just taken down from the cross, uh, there hovered his mother, the Virgin Mary, and his beloved uh, Mar uh, Mary Magdalene, weeping. And both of them were now the very image of Uzbek village women, crafted uh, as if from the purest white bread dough. Uh, dough. And they're just a bit removed from the mo morning women, the same collective farm worker stood sentinel. So I'll read a bit from the center, maybe from the very uh, middle of the, um, uh, this short story, and then we'll go to the final of the story. Back at his studio, Sukhrab kept thinking of that awkward watch he had kept under the cloak, and those two innocent boys kept appearing before his eyes. Sukhrab suddenly bit his lip. Though his nephew had been wearing the Scottish sweater he had given him that morning, his body had been wearing some sort of worn out old suit uh, and the same uh, flimsy old truck suit. To distract himself from them, Sukhrab needed some clay, wanting to salvage just one thing from the day's misfortunes. But no matter the circumstances, a hand cannot shape or form on its own. So the clay only dried in his hands and he could only let it crumble back into uh, teeny tiny pieces. When you peel an onion and you try to dig too deep into the core, past the first layer and tears come to your eyes, that was the kind of mood Sukhrop was in. Had he done the right thing? Had he done the right thing? Or should uh, he have found the boys some little job to do? like all the others, instead of sending them back to where they had come from. He had friends after all, and he might have found the right kind of place for them, even if it was just a night watchman or doing this or that at the center for the arts. There were plenty of Uzbek night watchmen in Moscow. Surely there was a room for one or two more. I wonder if sculptures as a class generally maintain a greater distance from their doubts and regrets. When you chip a piece of uh, a rock, it can never go back into place. There is no use wishing the shape back together again. But why at his age was he now, contrary to custom, still uh, tottering back and forth like this? After all, he hadn't sent his nephew uh, to his death or damnation. He had sent him back to his own motherland, his fatherland. But still, Sukhrop's heart uh, felt forged in play. Still, his heart, just like that ceramic dish, wouldn't be glued back together. Well, now I am a poet, he muttered, having a chuckle at what had happened. And in that instant, he realized what he should fashion out of the chunk and hunk of clay he had been kneading. And the final. The next day, the next day, nothing happened. The telephone didn't ring and the police didn't come looking for him. The Americans also choose to stay away. The day after that too passed uh, uneventfully. When the third day came, uh, the studio had been tidied up. The broken ceramic pieces and empty vodka bottles had been thrown into the ga uh, garbage and handful of black raisins nestled inside the golden dup dupi, uh, which sat upside down to serve uh, as a bow atop uh, the embroidered silk tablecloth. Sukhrop took the last $200 that remained in his stash, meaning to present it to Mashinka, his wife, that very evening. And just now, as he paused to listen to his own art, finally, calm, a new sculpture project was taking shape in his imagination. Maybe he'd call it the guest worker, something like that. That evening, returning home, Sukhrab gave Masha the $200 and the two of them relaxed with an expensive bottle of French wine while they sat watching television. The news showed a story about 68 illegal immigrants from Central Asia being forced by the police 
out of an old building scheduled to be torn down that they had turned into a campsite and guest house. No, and Sohrab looked very closely. His nephew Sangin wasn't among them, but the sight of these 68 human beings living like dogs set Sohrab's heart uh, pounding again, heart pounding again. That night, once again, Sohrab couldn't sleep. He blamed his insomnia on the wine he had drunk, the news he had watched, and also the duplicity with which he treated his Mashinka. His thoughts raced in all directions and gave him no rest. Once upon a time in his youth, when he had just come to Moscow, Sohrab too had been forced to spend the night in places unfit for a dog. And he remembered diving into his stu uh, studies during the day, first human anatomy, then the study of form, then the arts of stone cutting and clay working. He knew that all that suffering had been for the sake of the respected position he enjoyed today. Yet could that position save him now from burning in fire and flames like a stone statue? Not a bit. In all his indecision, the fire and flames were consuming him. Was Sukhrov, who had measured his life since a very young age in terms of work upon a great work, now falling victim to the petty bits and pieces of meaningless everyday life? Or was he simply consoling himself with those bits and pieces? You can talk and talk, but isn't the point to avoid breaking other people's hearts, fragile as glass, Sukhrop thought first of his angelic Mashinka, and Sukhrop thought of his sister Farah, whom he never knew, and uh, her scoundrel of a son, Sangin. What could he do to make them all happy? He thought and thought, and an idea came to him. He imagined a con uh, contraption like a cannon sitting on the seashore. His younger sister had been placed inside it, and then, as if shot from a slingshot, she flew off far over the ocean. She sought in the free flight of the sea and she emerged from the sea form as a perfect statue, the goddess Aphrodite. Maybe who could uh, sell that contraption to the Americans, it would make him piles of money. In the morning when he awoke in the undispersed semi-darkness of winter, he realized that the idea of the catapult machine still haunted him from out of the grogginess of night. Perhaps it had been a dream, but a strong desire to build the thing still lingered. So Rob didn't know whether to laugh or to cry when uh, a dawn came. By the time he reached his studio, the gloom of that dream still had not dissipated, and he felt unable to apply hand or mind to any sort of work. Again, Sohrab was plagued by thoughts about himself and his life, yet we will not be distracted. We will not go back on our promise. We have agreed to be loyal to the art of sculpture and we will proceed according to its rules. It was around noon when the phone rang. An unfamiliar official sounding Russian voice asked his name. This is Sohrab Surat Ali, answered Sohrab. Are you responsible for the individual known as Sangin Surat Ali, if the voice asked? Uh, sorry, I'm just, uh, uh, could you repeat that? Sukhrop was playing for time out of craftiness or denial. The voice at the other end sounded as if it were buried in paperwork. Sukhrop instantly thought to put down the receiver. That good for nothing was subjecting him to one more disaster, but he was unable to keep silent. Excuse me. Is everything all right, he asked. No, that's the problem. Nothing is all right, the voice snapped at him and then went on aggressively. What is, what all this is about? Didn't you promise my colleagues you'd look after him? Didn't you tell them you'd watch him and take care of him? Excuse me, but what exactly happened? Interrupted Sufrop impatiently. Did you give him money to spend at the casino at the airport? He lost it all, started a fight. And in the middle of the uh, rascals, he named you. What? What money? Are you asking the questions now? I, sir, I am supposed to be interrogating you. At that, Sukhrop's spirits began to sink. His knees shook. Feeling weak, he took a seat on the alabaster lap of a statue, and the statue cracked under him. There was no point hiding now. 
uh, I apologize, comrade, but what did you say your name was? Uh, yes, it's true. I gave Sangin some money to send him back home. Uh, he, he, he's a scoundrel, a fool. And all, all the pain and animosity of Sukhrop last few days came pouring out. This unfamiliar voice had penetrated right to his bowling, rolling heart. He told him about his visit to Altuviva, about his studio being turned upside down, about how the expensive Scottish sweaters he had given them were gone, along with every last bit of money he had kept from his wife, and they were not even really related at all to him. So Rob bundled all of this up and released his anger into the phone. I have no such relative. Do whatever you like with him, he declared, concluding his angry lament. Funny, usually officials demonstrate less patience, but this one maintained complete silence until Sukhrop was done speaking. Once Sukhrop bitter complaining was done, the man held to this respectful silence for a time, and then he continued. I apologize, but we have nothing left to do with him, he said. A skinhead went mad and stopped him in his jail cell. I was calling to tell you that you may come and collect his body. That December night was a snowless one, so far as if the great sculpture in the sky was just about to tear a statue apart by hand and plaster dust would soon be settling everywhere. So Rob and Marsha were on the road to Damadedeva airport. And I, too, am ready to depart now from what I agreed to on a whim. That's enough, I think. Literature is my art. That other profession is a merciless one. Hacking at stone, peeling layer upon layer of wood away from the core, and whether he ever reached the heart, the pit or not, I don't want to watch Sukhrop Surat Ali, the sculpture. On a harsh Moscow winter night, carrying the corpse of his frozen rascal of a nephew, like a stone statue from the jail to a waiting here, sir. Was this his life's work, his most heart-renderingly perfect statue? Was this the very elemental core of all his searching and striving? The naked, sharp truth is what it was, I say. I want to be done with this type of art, so foreign to me, in which I have been nothing but migrant laborer myself. Much better to wrap up in a warm, soft layer or conjecture and invention, don't you think? Come, let us start that. Our own part, start down our own part again. So Frog Surat Ali's friends used to call him Teasingly, Zurab Tsereteli. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hamid, um, for, this, for sharing this wonderful story. And uh, as we begin our discussion, I just want to remind the audience to please uh, enter any questions uh, you may have for Hamid into the chat function on YouTube, and Sophie will um, come around to them in a, in a little while. Um, and I think she's also going to share another link from Words Without Borders that offers some more resources for contextualizing and interpreting the story. But perhaps to um, get the discussion started off, and I'm joined now by my colleague from Slavic, Associate Professor Harsha Ram. Um, I wonder if I might ask a preliminary question, uh, Hamid, uh, about, about this text and um, how, how you came to write it. So what really strikes me about the story, um, perhaps, it would strike most people is this interesting combination of uh, a meditation on art uh, and the nature of a particular art form, uh, sculpture, and the distinctive quality of that art form, um, alongside an account of, uh, the, of migration, of the experience of uh, specifically post-Soviet migrants from Central Asia in Moscow uh, as, as a mass phenomenon of, of the post-Soviet period. Um, and he's going to distinguish them perhaps from someone like Sukhrob, who is a, is a migrant of an earlier period, right? From the, uh, from someone who migrated within the Soviet Union from Soviet Uzbekistan to Moscow and has established himself as a, as a fairly well-respected artist. Um, 
So I wonder what to make of the fact that you're bringing these two themes, these two questions together um, in, in a very pronounced way in this story. Is there a kind of analogy being drawn here? Um, is there some way in which the sculptor's complete control over his work somehow is juxtaposed to his lack of control over his actual life? Um, is it that the sculptor's work for all its kind of vaunted uh, cultural cachet is actually um, on some level still uh, equally debased, equally dependent on the wealth of others as, as the migrant workers. I wondered if you could share any thoughts you have on that. So obviously several ideas were, you know, making me to write this uh, short story. First of all, the scale of the migration to Russia of uh, Uzbeks, of Tajiks, of Kyrgyz, Central Asians from Caucasus, uh, all former Soviet uh, countries. Mm -hmm. uh, Maybe when I was writing this particular short story, and it was written in the early 2000-ish uh, uh, years, uh, I wasn't uh, rationalizing or thinking about the post-colonialism and the tendencies of post-colonialism. Maybe the first approach of mine was emotional one. Uh, because, uh, you know, uh, generally this migration broke lots of uh, taboos in the Uzbek society, lots of uh, uh, cultural traditions in the Uzbek society. It was so unexpected by uh, its scale, by its numbers, by its uh, sweeping nature, that uh, first uh, uh, me as a writer maybe took it uh, quite emotionally. Uh, on the other hand, on the other hand, uh, you know, as a writer, you're always uh, looking for the new forms and for the new ways of storytelling. And short story allows you, in a way, uh, you know, be as poetic as possible, because poetry for me is about the new forms uh, of the, you know, of saying, of expressing yourself. Uh, prose is more about uh, situations, about it's a longer thing, so you can't play too much with the form in the long prose. But short story gives exactly the right balance when you can use the, uh, you know, formality of a poem at the same time, the storytelling of the, uh, uh, of the novel, let's say, or novella. And in that sense, yes, uh, maybe one of the ideas, uh, there are lots of ideas, I believe, in this uh, uh, short story. But at the same time, one of the ideas maybe, which is uh, coming back to me while I'm reading now, uh, was that all of us, we are migrants in a way. When I was young, when I used to write poetry, one of my lines was, Mien yolimdan adashib bu man. Uh, going astray, I came to this world. So all of us, we are migrants and guests in this world. So though we are expressing our ownership of certain territories or whatever, but uh, uh, possibly our forefathers came here as migrants or uh, forefathers of our forefathers. So uh, despite, or, uh, despite of uh, our upbringing, despite of our affluence uh, and all of that, all of us are migrants. The elite is also migrant, might be migrant. So Sukhrop, uh, in a way, he, uh, he is the symbol of this elitist, you know, uh, migration, who feels himself, uh, you know, one off migration mm -hmm. uh, in the face of the mass migration of those people who he considers a riffraff of this world, yeah? But mm -hmm. that is the point where art meets the life. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, you know, this um, juxtaposition, for example, between the uh, uh, life and the art is at the center of this particular piece, for example. Obviously, the sculpture or the art of sculpture gives additional uh, challenges for a writer, you know? You can be, uh, for example, you can use fugas in your uh, short stories. You can use, for example, uh, you know, the art of composing, for example, musical composing. But here I decided to go for the uh, sculpture 
because, because I wanted to come to the very essence of this relationship between the art and the real life. Um, I notice also the, I mean, the title is a kind of intertextual aside, right? Um, gesturing towards Pushkin's uh, Malinka Tragedia, Carmen Ghost. Yes, uh, and the title plays here a, a certain role because uh, Sangin in, uh, in Tajik or in uh, Persian means uh, the uh, stone. Mm -hmm. So the person who is coming, he is a stone as well, you know, and uh, reference to Pushkin here is uh, playing a certain role because in Pushkin, uh, coming the ghost or the stone guest is a retribution, mm -hmm. is a symbol of retribution. Here, in the start, at the, at the very beginning of the short story, he is nuisance rather than retribution. But from nuisance, he is becoming the retribution, you know. we. Maybe one of the challenges of this story or the problems which this story is posing in front of myself as the author, in front of you as a reader, is, you know, are we entitled to uh, consider any human being as a nuisance or not? Because the retribution is very, very harsh. Mm -hmm. Do you see the, um, I suppose it makes me wonder if there's a sort of, uh, part of that retribution is that um, Sukhrob has in some way uh, abandoned his responsibility to the place from which he comes. Um, is this a kind of, I mean, you spoke about it as, a, as a part of a sort of perhaps universal experience of migration, but there also seems to be in the story a certain idea of a responsibility towards home towards the place from which you have come that can't be entirely dismissed, even if he sort of seems to take it most throughout most of the story as a kind of unpleasant burden that he is in some sense obliged to help these people. Yes, we may even think that he became one of the Russians because yeah, everyone is calling him one of the Soviets because everyone is calling him Zurab Tseretelli, who is the ultimate uh, kind of, you know, uh, symbol of the Soviet art, let's say, yeah, or of the uh, end of the Soviet empire. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, yeah, let's allow him to be a Soviet uh, person, let's say. Uh, and even though he may not care about his homeland or whatever, at least he must uh, care about another human being. Mm -hmm. Whatever this human being is, yeah. Sometimes, you know, as I'm saying, he looks at this human, another human being as a nuisance to his life, to his art. But it turns out that uh, this human being, uh, in a way, reflects the very essence of the human, human nature. You know, uh, and he brings out, he brings out like the, uh, like the Kamene Gosti, you know, the very essence of the, he poses the very essential question, uh, which he was looking all his life, you know, going to the very core of the things. So here we are, human to he, human is the very essence of our sort of art of our, uh, you know, message to this world, in a way. Hmm. When we are allowed to lose our humanity, you know, with what? What is the, you know, uh, this uh, uh, crossing line when we are allowed to treat another person as rubbish, as riffraff or whatever? Or scoundrel, as he puts it there. There's also the presence of the, um, that seems also to be relevant to the presence of the American guests in the story, who are actually the other guests, right? There's the second set of guests uh, who have come from the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York uh, to visit the famous uh, sculptor Surab. Um, when they arrive, um, it's just after his, his relative has trashed his studio and uh, took on his nerves after encounters come in um, and they think oh well you're just uh, I can't remember the exact words but sort of he's being true to his Russian nature right in some way that he's there and he smells of vodka and everything's a total mess um, 
and it seems like in some sense there's almost this kind of chain of a sort of a sort of a hierarchy of elites looking down on people that they see as not quite at their level right yes or, stay stay aside i'm look at i'm going to talk to the very important person type of uh, relationship you know so uh, you are nuisance because uh, i'm dealing with different people in different circumstances for different purposes but uh, this contrast is showing that uh, you know you can't uh, relate to other human being you know on the basis of hierarchy on the basis of you know of values uh, material values let's say uh, because uh, these people americans are giving him uh, money but uh, so, uh, sangin is taking uh, all his uh, savings which we, which he didn't give even to his wife to mashenka Mm -hmm. yeah. I wonder if I might ask a kind of a broader question about this story, um, both in the context of your own work, but also, as you say, um, this phenomenon of Central Asian migration to Russia in the post-Soviet period is, is such a huge and significant social phenomenon. Um, I wonder what your sense is of how much it is reflected in other forms of, of cultural production. Um, I mean, I'm, there's, there's the recent Kazakh film, Aika, right? Um, I'm forgetting the name of the, the director right now, but it's about um, a, a Kazakh or maybe Kyrgyz woman who gives birth while she's working in Moscow and the question around whether she can actually keep the child or not. Um, that, would, that caused quite a lot of um, attention recently. Um, do you feel like this is a wider phenomenon that has been sufficiently illuminated? Um, I don't think so. I don't think so because uh, generally, for the Central Asian uh, authorities, uh, be it authorities, political authorities, or aesthetical authorities, uh, uh, this is one of the taboo uh, themes. Generally, migration is one of the taboo theme, uh, themes uh, because because it shows the situation within the countries uh, the, which can't, uh, for example, provide uh, the population with uh, jobs, for example. The level of employment is so big, even if uh, there is employment, uh, so the payment for this employment is so low. Therefore, people are traveling uh, uh, and living through all mayhem, for example, through all xenophobia in Russia. Lots of them, uh, especially initially, were killed, were beaten up under constant uh, violent uh, relationship uh, uh, from the police. Uh, of uh, uh, Russia. So in that sense, unfortunately, it's one of the taboo themes. Though the brave artists from Central Asia, like uh, you mentioned, uh, uh, Aika, for example, film, uh, uh, there was another film, the Uzbek film of uh, Yusuf Raz uh, uh, Razikov uh, about the uh, migrants as well, about the father, coming to, uh, you know, to find his son uh, in Russia. So there were attempts, but unfortunately not enough. And therefore, you know, seeing the scale of this problem, uh, I myself uh, wrote uh, not just one uh, short story, not just this one, but a series of short stories about different uh, aspects of this uh, migration, mass migration uh, to, Russia to other countries, uh, because it's a huge social problem, you know. It uh, goes hand in hand with criminality, with human traffic, with, uh, uh, you know, modern slavery. All of that is present uh, in uh, this migration. Mm -hmm. All of that is uh, present in this migration. But as I'm saying, unfortunately, for the authorities, it's not the, uh, you know, picture they want to see. They want to see. Even in political terms, for example, the authorities, they should have protected these migrants with some kind of, uh, you know, uh, bilateral agreements, bilateral uh, decisions between uh, the Central Asian countries and Russia, let's say. Some of them doing some of these jobs, uh, Kyrgyzstan, for example, did some of job, you know, protecting their migrants. But Uzbekistan, Tajikistan never even discussed these issues, mm -hmm. unfortunately. 
perhaps this could be a moment I could jump in. Yes, please. Ed, really okay? Absolutely, Asha, go ahead. Oh, okay. So I actually was, I was also equally, you know, intrigued by the, the way that you juxtapose these two art forms, explicitly sculpture and then implicitly literature. Uh, sculpture being thematized through the work of the hero, literature implicitly thematized through your work. And the way you kind of, you essentially contrast literature and sculpture is in some ways dialectically opposed because sculpture in some ways, as you put it, pairs away and removes the superfluous in order to reveal what you say is the essence of things. While literature is in a sense about adding on, right? What you call at the end of the story, this soft layer of conjecture and invention, right? Um, and there's almost the sense of, at the beginning, a kind of envy towards the, 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 the work of the sculptor because the sculptor is the one who is able to get at the essence while literature simply adds on in, by way of fiction. But what struck me is that by the end of the story, these two, this relationship is actually reversed, right? Where you, uh, Hamid Ismailov, as a writer, are able to accomplish what your hero, Sohrab, did not, right? And so I was wondering what that says about literature, right? That even as you, you, you make this, you pay this homage to another art form, you actually steal, right? It's, it's, it's uh, credentials, it's, it's, it's unique capacity. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about what that says, particularly in the context, of course, of the Islamic tradition where the idea of sculpture is on the one hand forbidden, Right? But then there is also this long tradition in, in Arabic and Persian and Urdu poetry, perhaps in Uzbek as well, in which the, the beloved is also uh, described as a but, as, a, as an idol, right? Yes, it's a very good question. So, but obviously, there, there was a, some playfulness in, uh, you know, juxtaposing those things. Yeah. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, that the arts are inter interchangeable in a way, you know, because they are sort of, you know, inter, um, intercrossing in a way. They are part of, we are, as human beings, you know, we are not uh, compartmentalized as sculptures, as uh, writers, as musicians, uh, no, the art comes from the same uh, impulse in a way, in a human being, uh, mm -hmm. to tell the story in different manner, in different manner, through, uh, through uh, let's say, objects, through uh, sounds, through tastes, through this and that, yeah, uh, through words, like, uh, for example, I am doing. So mm -hmm. in that sense, the impulse is the same, telling the story through different mm -hmm. means. Mm -hmm. Though we as human beings, we love to separate everything, to put everything, uh, you know, to stamp everything separately and put on different shelves. And there was a certain playfulness here, as you are saying, mm -hmm. uh, chiasmatic uh, playfulness here to uh, play with these two concepts as if they are uh, different to each other or opposite uh, to each other. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, no, they are not opposite. And the essence, once again, we're coming to the same conclusion, mm -hmm. what Sukhrop was doing throughout his life, uh, expressing himself expressing the world around him yeah why he wants to for example to make his pieta or mm -hmm. why he wants to make his you know uh, ultimate sculpture so mm -hmm. because he wants to get the ultimate truth of human uh, nature in a way mm -hmm. uh, which is given the, us through uh, colors through sounds through taste through words through all of that together as well so there was a certain playfulness in that one. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, the, the, the second question uh, that I had for you, which I think was partly, uh, you know, largely anticipated by Edward, but I'll, I'll perhaps phrase it slightly differently. When, when, we, when, we, um, when we sat down yesterday to discuss your Russian work, Pakayanya, uh, uh, Re Repentance, we, I think many of us in the class were marveling at the density of its literary allusions to the classical tradition of 19th century Russian literature. And as Edward pointed out, we have yet another reference here in the title, as well as in the name of the, the hero, Sangin, to, uh, to, to the stone guest, Kamini Ghost. 
Um, at the same time, what gets a very strong sense, and we got this yesterday as well, that however, however, however dense the text is with allusions to this past, this classical past, you're very much rooted in a kind of post late Soviet and post Soviet present, in which um, those allusions have to play a necessarily different role, specifically with respect to the relationship between art and life or art and death and life, right? And it struck me when I was, I went back and I was thinking more about the stone guest and its relationship to your story, the Pushkin text. And it struck me that both texts in many ways are tragic, right? But in fact, what Pushkin's story does, which draws on this romantic tradition of the fantasticiske, right? The fantastical tale. In that, in that text, the statue of the dead commander is actually reanimated. Right? comes back to life so that the story traces a passage from kind of a death to a kind of ghostly life, right? Uh, into which he then draws the hero Don Juan, right? Um, but in your story, in fact, something different happens that the guest worker Sanguine goes from not from death to life, but from life to death, right? So there's a kind of an inversion there of that in, in that and his dead body becomes essentially the, the sculptor's tragic legacy, right? And there is no possibility of resuscitating or reviving his body, except arguably through your story, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering then if you, if you felt that you had reached some perhaps a slightly different conclusion about what art can do, right? Um, does it still, can it still revive or resuscitate uh, the way Pushkin's story can, where, where the statue comes back to life or is your vision of art different in some way that that's more rooted in a more perhaps even more radically tragic understanding of what art can do or what it cannot do? It's a difficult question. It's a very difficult question because uh, yes, uh, all of us, we are in dialogue with our cultures, with our past, uh, and all, we're always revisiting the, our archetypes, the cultural archetypes, uh, the, uh, you know, the uh, things which our forefathers said or did. Uh, so it's a constant revision, it's obvious. But at the same time, yes, uh, by uh, uh, doing that, we, are, we might and we are coming to different conclusions because the life is changing. The life is changing. Our experiences are changing. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, maybe one of the things uh, which occupies me very often when I'm playing or when I'm using the, uh, you know, some themes or archetypes from the past, you know, to apply them to, 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 to my life in a way, to mm. um, examine them by my life, by my vision, which might be completely different. Uh, sometimes I think that literature, though we don't say it very often as writers, it's like a sort of, you know, put, um, doing an experiment, like physical experiment, but in a way, psychological experiment, let's say, yeah, to probe some uh, concept, some theories through the life of your characters, mm. whether it proves it or disp disproves, for example, the assumption, yeah, previously come uh, by Pushkin, by Tolstoy, by, uh, you know, Lermontov, if I'm writing in Russian, but if I'm writing in Uzbek, by Navoye, Padri, and others. So it's always a sort of give and take in that sense, and you might come, and you are coming very often to different conclusions, mm -hmm. different conclusions. One thing which sort of protects me to put a stamp and say, that is the, uh, you know, that is the truth is once again seeing them, you know, they might have believed that was the truth, yeah? But you are coming to different conclusions with the same material in a way. So therefore, I would rather leave it open to uh, the readers and to the audience, you know, to interpret it in their own manner, but mm -hmm. I'll give the results of my experiment. Mm -hmm. I'll show the results of my experiment. Mm -hmm. and, and then in that sense, each, each work of art is an experiment that, that yes, shows yes. its own limited truth. Yes, right? absolutely. But you absolutely. don't want to necessarily generalize. 
Absolutely, absolutely. Though we play sort of, you know, in generalization, for example, here I played with the, uh, as I told you for your previous question, played quite generalizing, let's say, rules of sculpture and rules of literature, but in fact, they are much more co complex, those rules. Yeah. Sometimes we are playing with them in order to sort of, you know, to, uh, to uh, make this experiment more obvious in a way. Mm -hmm. I see. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, one final question I would have has to do actually with the theme that, again, Edward also touched upon of migration. And I was particularly struck by the fact that you focused in this story not on the the you know the 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 apparatus of the Russian state, nor do you even ultimately point to the actual killer of Sangin, who is described in passing as a Russian skinhead, right? Who is undoubtedly in the immediate sense responsible for Sangin's death, right? But in a sense, you make the story about the sculptor's responsibility, which is not simply the responsibility of one um, family member for another, but in a sense, I think he's in a sense a stand-in for you, right? Because you, you talk about your own responsibility in, as an immigrant. And I'm, I'm wondering here, I mean, and I think this could be said of all three of us, Edward, myself, and you present, we're actually all immigrants here, right? And at the same time there, I think you've made this very, what's I think the great insight of your story is that you essentially made a kind of sharp distinction between two kinds of migration, right? The, those of us who have migrated for um, professional purposes and who still enjoy many of the privileges of citizenship, and with all of the, 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 the mobility and the professional success that that can afford. And then the other kind of migration, right? The undocumented, the refugee, um, the, the guest worker. And it strikes me that perhaps the great merit of the story is to juxtapose those two kinds of migration, both of which have, I think, shaped the world we live in today, but which in fact um, have very different socioeconomic trajectories and we often, I think, obscure one in favor of the other. So I was wondering if you had any final thoughts on that. Yeah, uh, it's a very good question. Uh, so uh, you're absolutely right, yes. By showing that, you are closer uh, to understanding the other side as well, you know, because generally the, with the xenophobia, the, it's quite uh, understandable that the, what xenophobia is. Uh, so there is no subtleties there so much. It's better maybe to, you know, I'm thinking to myself, for example, we're talking quite a lot about radicalism, yeah? For example, Islamic radicalism, which is against, let's say, America, let's say, yeah? But take tomorrow out America of this equation, yeah? This radicalism will be fighting their own countries. Mm -hmm. Take out the countries, they will be fighting, you know, the, the, the other street or the other city of mm -hmm. that country. Take mm -hmm. out the other country of this uh, or street from this equation, they will be fighting their brothers. Mm -hmm. So basically the nature is the same in a way of xenophobia. So mm -hmm. in a way, uh, I'm trying to show here the xenophobia of Sukhrab in a way, mm -hmm. rather than showing the black and white xenophobia of uh, a policeman, let's say, yeah. Policeman is present there, he is making money out of that or beating up them and so, so forth, yeah? But uh, the mechanism, in order to understand the real mechanism, the core of mechanism, it's better to sort of, you know, to put this, um, you know, experience as close as possible, two particles too close to each other in a way. Mm -hmm. Then you start to understand where this, uh, you know, uh, displeasure with other person comes. In a way, so uh, I thought that is the better way to show the uh, nature of xenophobia, rather than sort of you know to show the black and white uh, uh, police brutality against the migrant, which we are showing in news, which we are showing anywhere. Yeah. So for me, the task was uh, more subtle, you know, yes. how the xenophobia appears in a person even so a refined person as Sukhrab Surat Ali. And that xenophobia would be 
not e it's, it's immediately evident through the class distinction between yes. the two. Yes. But are you suggesting then there's something even deeper than that, which is the fear, the 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 fear of the other within oneself, the the of something that one has left behind or, or repressed within oneself? Might be that one, or for example, generally it's about sort of you know your disorder in my order. Mm -hmm. You are bringing your chaos into my order. That uh -huh. is the essence of the you know yeah. you are sort of you know screwing everything up in my yeah. house. So right. that is the right. yeah in a way. Okay. This Edward, back to you. Maybe a good time actually to uh, open up to some questions from our audience. I believe we already have a few gathering themselves in yes. the YouTube. And please, once again, everybody, uh, feel free to post any comments or questions you have uh, for Hamid and we will read them out. And I'm going to call on uh, Sophie Locke, uh, who is a graduate student in the Slavic department, um, who's going to read out some of the questions uh, that we have online. So Sophie, over to you. Thank you so much and thank you Hamid um, for this wonderful reading. Um, I think one of the first, there are two questions I'd like to pair together perhaps, they both relate to translation. The first question is from Mary Nicholas who asks, the main character struggles to speak in Uzbek since he's lived so long in Moscow with his Russian wife and she's kind of asking about the texture of the original Uzbek um, text and whether the omniscient narrator himself has a colloquial or natural or academic register um, in contradistinction to our hero. Um, and then the second question to kind of couple this with, we're thinking about um, transitions and translation is from Sabrina, who um, I believe is also um, a translator from uh, Uzbek into English. Um, and Sabrina asks, um, many of the events on your tour have focused on translation of your own work into English, but could you maybe speak um, about your work as a translator from Uzbek and other languages, and potentially the translations that you make um, between your own kind of uh, fictional worlds that exist in Russian and Uzbek? So that's the first one. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sophie. So I'll read maybe the a bit uh, in Uzbek, yeah, where uh, maybe you can uh, gather something here. Uh, pap, pap. Aha. <laughs> so, Assalamu alaikum, Dustum. Men toyrning loyha haqida menda gaplangan khudoshniklar masalasi shu fham bor edi. Bazı ulardan Rashid Frijim bilan aralashgan. Hozirgina vafo etgan Kanchalovskiyning so'zi xayolimga qolyapti. Kudoshniklar katta yolg'onga qatnashishi mumkin emas. Boyishqa tomondan ularning ibadiy sifati nihoyatan ham ulug'mi? So it's completely broken Uzbek. So it's completely broken Uzbek here uh, which has been translated by Shelley so uh, you can read in the you know translation so he is using uh, new words which non existent in Uzbek he uh, the sort of you know takes two words and uh, smashes into one word for example uh, he is all over the places with uh, declination he is all over the places with the uh, suffixes, with everything, with choice of words as well. So it's completely broken Uzbek, Russified broken Uzbek in the uh, original. So uh, Shelley was responsible for the translation of this particular uh, piece of, uh, you know, of Uzbek into English. As for my translation uh, life. Uh, yes, I spent 20, 25 years of my uh, life uh, translating literature from different languages. Uh, firstly, it was a pragmatic decision uh, because, uh, you know, I couldn't publish my poetry because it was too decadent for the Soviet uh, uh, poetry. Therefore, I used uh, as a shield uh, people like uh, uh, Verlaine, Rimbo, uh, Apollinaire, uh, you know, and uh, or Lorca. Uh, so you used to translate them into Uzbek, Mandelstam, by the way, too. Mm. So uh, quite a lot of uh, po poetic translation. 
then uh, it turned into a sort of, you know, many money making uh, tool in a way, because uh, people were asking me, you know, queuing, uh, uh, you know, to, to be translated. And I've translated several books which I completely didn't like. And I don't like this period of my life because uh, you should have lived, uh, you know, earned some money. And uh, it was an easy translation, you know, no challenges at all, just straightforward translation. So I was playing the role of Google at that time, uh, translating from one language to another, mostly from Uzbek into Russian. But then, uh, I found more noble way of uh, translating because <clears throat> I consider him my uh, teacher in a way. There was an academic in Uzbekistan, Azizvan Pulatovich Kayumov, a wonderful connoisseur of our classic literature, number one connoisseur of our uh, classic literature. He invited one day me to uh, his Institute of Manuscripts and he said, We've got plenty untranslated, unpublished manuscripts of our great, great medieval literature. I am hiring you to translate it into Russian. And under his, uh, you know, auspice, I've translated uh, Sufi poems of Ahmad Yugnaki, of Alicia Navoi, of uh, uh, Muhammad Nias Nishati, of uh, uh, Sai Kali. Plenty, plenty of wonderful first class, uh, world class poetry into Russian. Unfortunately, nothing of that has been published, you know. But I'm looking forward at some point, maybe uh, those poems will be translated. Here, I use all my art. I've studied this uh, the wonderful literature, and it was one kind of my academy, you know how to render from language uh, to language and uh, using 100% of your uh, you know, skills, uh, of your effort, of your zeal uh, and enthusiasm. So unfortunately, as I'm saying, nothing has been translated, but I've got a book so-called Uzbek uh, Sufi uh, Poems, uh, you know, a big book uh, which is ready to be published in Russian. So hopefully one day I'll publish it. Thank you so much. Yeah, we do have um, another question from the chat that comes from Emna Salami, um, who asks about um, your practice of choosing art forms to engage with and whether you might offer um, a comparison or just an engagement with um, his sculpture versus uh, the music and the Dombra violin playing in Wunderkin Dirjan. Yes, you can use all As I said, I was writing quite decadent poetry, yes? And uh, that quite decadent poetry, one of the tasks of this quite decadent poetry. When I was 23, uh, uh, so I wrote a symphony, a, po a poetry symphony, uh, which was called Lorkiana. Uh, so it was devoted to Lorca, but where I tried what, uh, you know, Scriabin tried in music to unite all the forms of arts in one, uh, in the word, you know. So there I applied all kinds of, I studied uh, all the aesthetics of all kinds of art forms, you know, in order to use in my poetry. And I wrote this symphony. I wrote this symphony and I'll tell you a comic situation with that one. So I started to look where to perform it. Uh, I was 23, you know, uh, uh, wanted to become uh, a celebrity in Tashkent, you know, with this symphony. So uh, there were no places where to perform it. Ultimately, uh, my friend, uh, Mark Weil, the, who used to run the uh, theater Ilfom, he said, there is a, an elitist cinema theater in Tashkent, Pioneer, where they used to show Tarkovsky's film, Vida's films. So just buy this uh, cinema theater and perform there. 
So I went to this cinema theater with the recommendation of uh, Mark Weil and I bought uh, for 70 rubles, which was my monthly salary, the uh, cinema uh, theater for one night. Mm. So basically, instead of uh, uh, showing the film, you know, uh, I bought to show my, my performance. I paid for all seats in the uh, cinema theater. So then uh, the performance should have been quite strange. So basically, uh, I should have read my poetry and uh, uh, they should have been a sort of, you know, light from my, from my behind, you know, and the, uh, the, the shadows of my hands, for example, moving in different manner should have, uh, should have affected the sitting fall, you know, uh, the audiences. But uh, according to the rules of this cinema theater, we couldn't install any lamps there. Uh, because in cinema you can't uh, install any lamps. We decided to find at least the uh, chandeliers, you know, the chandeliers with five uh, uh, candles uh, on it. But candles were too big, you know, it was the Soviet time, so could, uh, you couldn't find anything. The candles were too big in order to fit the chandelier. So basically we cut them into five pieces, which were uh, hardly sort of fitting the chandelier. And the uh, script was like that. So a young lady announced that for the first time in the world, there is the poetry symphony by Hamid Ismailov. And then she goes back to, uh, uh, to the hall and sits in the first row. Uh, and at that time, the uh, electrician of the cinema theater switched off the light and I start my performance. So everything turned uh, like it turns in Soviet Union upside down. So uh, we gave to the electrician a bottle of uh, vodka in order to perform his duties. He drank this vodka before the performance. So from the very beginning, he switched off the light. So poor lady, he went to the scene, you know, and stumbled and fell down. So that was the beginning of the performance of the world premiere of my symphony. And instead of saying Golos в тишине, she said Grom в ночи. So announced as a Grom в ночи. And instead of sitting in the first row of the cinema theater, she all of a sudden, you know, uh, started to run uh, across the scene and stumbled upon me who was coming <laughs> out of the scene, you know, with the chandelier, with the candles. So everything dropped down. <laughs> so basically it was a failure upon a failure upon a failure. So uh, that was my first experience of bringing all arts together, <laughs> you know. So ever since I started uh, to... So, become very suspicious of bringing cards together. So in that sense, I'm working very, very cautiously now, you know, trying, for example, as you are suggesting, for example, just Dombre in the Dead Lake or sculpture in the, in the stone guest. So, mm -hmm. but the idea behind that, that the, um, all the arts are interchangeable and we could uh, repeat the experiences of, you know, our, forefathers uh, who lived during the, the Renaissance time, we can be uh, quite uh, artful in many arts. So that would be my maybe answer. Sorry for the long answer, but yeah, that was uh, the case with arts. Thank you so much. Um, again, there are two um, additional questions in the chat, um, which I also think maybe we can think about um, in relationality to each other. The first is from Olga Silberborg, who is asking about this theme of migration, um, specifically towards Russia and how it fits within your broader um, scope of work. And she's asking particularly about um, Gaia, Queen of Ants, and the theme of migration to Europe. And then uh, Masha Whittle, who is um, a graduate student in our department, is asking, um, 
also about this kind of um, geography or cultural geography that's embedded within your text and um, where you see the relationship lying between literature and art and space and how you see um, literature and art as speaking through each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Olga, and thank you, Masha. So uh, migration. Migration, as I said, uh, initially we were quite uh, unexperienced and we didn't uh, expect this scale of migration because I tell it often that during the Soviet time there were lots of, uh, uh, you know, attempts to migrate Uzbeks into Russia under the uh, communist uh, regime. So, for example, there was a campaign to move Uzbeks to Nichernazemye in order to work in Nichernazemye, which was abandoned by Russian uh, peasants and farmers. So Uzbeks used to go there, live maybe a week or so, and immediately come back. So there were lots of cases of sending Uzbeks to Udarne Kamsamolsky Stroiki as well. For uh, as soon as they arrived there, they would spend one day, two days, and back to uh, Uzbekistan. So in that sense, so Uzbekistan was a chlebne mieste in a way, so they didn't want to change it or replace with any other. But after the collapse of the Soviet Union, all of a sudden, all the traditions, all the uh, you know local customs were broken up, and both uh, uh, men and uh, women and also children and also old people started to migrate to Russia. But then later we started to understand that it's a sort of normal process which uh, happened during the sort of, you know, breakup of the British Empire, of the French Empire, with Windrush, with, uh, you know, uh, lots of uh, people from Bangladesh, from Pakistan, coming to uh, Britain, for example. Uh, colonies, usually, they go after their metropolis uh, for different uh, purposes. Uh, some go for education, some go uh, by... Uh, sort of intermarriages, some go by uh, previous connections, some go for better life, some go for earning some money and uh, provide something uh, and supply money to their uh, own countries. So the same happened with Uzbekistan, with Kyrgyzstan, with Tajikistan. Russians were not expecting that one, Uzbeks, they were not expecting that one, but it happened like in every sort of case of uh, post-colonial uh, post development. And now we are much cleverer in that sense. Uh, we can project what would happen, for example, in this relationship, you know, in the uh, in future, uh, looking at the experiences of Britain, of France, of other uh, uh, great empires, uh, who were sort of, you know, uh, bro broke up as empires. So it allows you to project something so you, you can learn. But unfortunately, neither Russian side nor our Central Asians, uh, they consider it uh, as if it's happening for the first time. They don't consider that it's post-colonial. They never considered that it was colony as well. So lots of resentment towards that. But uh, specialist people, artists are looking through the lenses of what might happen. For example, I'll give you an example of uh, in literature, let's say. Uh, how, uh, for example, you know, the post-colonial uh, representatives of col yesterday's colonies became the leading force in the literatures. Uh, you remember Vyas Naipaul, you remember Salman Rushdie, Tariq Ali, all of them, yeah? Uh, Mohsin Hamid uh, and all of them uh, who write beautifully in English. Uh, so sometimes their style is uh, uh, even uh, you know, even more exemplary than uh, the mainstream literature of the metropolis. The same is happening in Russia with the names of Guzel Yakhina, with the names of Alisa Ganiva, many, uh, you know, people who are doing this kind of uh, uh, literature. It's an example, one of the examples. So, 
Uh, as for the second question, as for the second question, literature and uh, reality, yes. Uh, as I said, uh, I'm trying... literature and space, I think. Space, yeah, literature geography. and space, geogra uh, geography. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, since I'm moving around the world, you know, but the, so my literature and my uh, observations are also moving with me, uh, moving with me, not just in terms of, uh, you know, of uh, my perceptions, but in terms of my language, in terms uh, even of choosing language or choosing forms uh, uh, of storytelling. Uh, so uh, I am an open-minded person, you know, but open to all kinds of influences. Uh, so living 25 or 26 years in England, for example, uh, obviously it was the longest period, uh, you know, I lived in one place, for example. So obviously I've adopted lots of things, you know, good, bad, maybe, uh, of the population which lives in Britain. Uh, I became a part of this British culture in a way. So it reflects in my writing as well. So for example, uh, Gaia, which you quoted, uh, is written uh, and happening in Eastbourne uh, in Sussex, uh, though the uh, main characters are Central Asians, but uh, Central Asians uh, deprived of their natural habitat or na natural space. So once again, it's an experience for me to look what happens to people, you know, which are deprived of their natural habitats and natural uh, spaces. Uh, and by looking at them, I look, I'm looking at myself as well, at my own experience. Through them, I'm uh, learning about myself as well. And through uh, learning myself, I'm creating those characters as well. So it's a sort of interchangeable, uh, uh, you know, process. If I could maybe follow up on one of those um, strands from that set of very interesting questions that, that Sophie just shared with us. Um, from what you've just said, it seems that to some extent um, you perhaps did not necessarily understand yourself as a post-colonial writer, that you feel a certain affinity with um, other figures who might be classified in, in that way, um, figures like Rushdie and Naipaul. Um, I wondered if you could speak a little bit about where you, how you understand your relationship to other, um, other forms of Central Asian writing of, of the late Soviet and post-Soviet period. Um, I was thinking particularly of a figure like uh, Chinggis Akhmatov, for example, um, whose texts often contain a kind of combination of folklore and legend and myth um, with a more kind of contemporary realist mode, right? This kind of fantastical realism, perhaps, um, that's sometimes compared to the magical realism of someone like Garcia Marquez. Um, is that strain of really late Soviet writing something that you see as an influence for you or something that's trying to do something similar to what you attempt in your own work? Uh, there are two parts uh, of uh, this question. One is, uh, you know, influences. Uh, another thing is intention of myself, for example. Yeah, uh, intentionally, I never tried to be uh, specifically different to, to, you know, to someone else. Yeah, I was trying always to be myself in a way. Uh, when I'm saying myself, it's not something monolith, it's something fixed, something, uh, you know, uh, uh, just forever. It's fluid thing, you know. Uh, as I'm saying, you know, if I moved, uh, uh, if I lived in France a year, uh, some features of my uh, psyche have changed, yeah. Uh, if I lived a good year in Germany, obviously, I was influenced by German uh, culture as well. Uh, if I lived uh, for so many years in uh, England, obviously, so I adopted some uh, traits and features of English life as well. So in that sense, uh, I'm ever changing person in a way. And I'm trying to fix myself, though I'm escaping from all kinds of isms, yeah? Uh, I'm not becoming uh, uh, 
God blessed me, and not becoming a member of groups, let's say, of Central Asian writers, though they try to always to uh, stamp, you know, upon me, a Central Asian writer, an Uzbek writer, uh, a British writer, or whatever. But uh, luckily, I was escaping somehow all these definitions, yeah, for the sake of my, my own writing. So, uh, in that sense, I will be changing and I will be writing those things which, you know, the group writers never write. Like, for example, you know, uh, against the Uzbek writers, I will be writing in Russian. Against the Russian writers, or in comparison, not against, in comparison to Russian writers, I will be writing in uh, Uzbek. Against the... or. Uh, in comparison with some writers who can, like Aitmatov, who were writing both in their language and in Russian, uh, I wrote several novels in English, for example, and about English life, not about the Uzbek life in Uzbekistan. So that differs me from an English writer or British writer as well, you know? So I was lucky in that sense, you know, to escape all the groupings, one thing. But influences is completely different thing, yeah? And here, when I'm writing, for example, Central Asian novels, be it happening in Kazakhstan, be it happening like, for example, Manashti is happening between Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, yeah? I feel the shadow of Aitmatov everywhere. You know, the issues are so similar, which here we used to raise, yeah? And I'm raising. Though luckily, you know, for every Tolkien, there is a, a rolling, yeah, a new rolling. So in that sense, <laughs> so the time is changing always, you know, for every Aitmata, there is another smile of maybe, you know. Though we are talking maybe about the same themes, the same, uh, you know, issues, but the time is changing and these themes or these issues uh, uh, you know, acquiring new features, new uh, meanings. But I'm constantly feeling his shadow, you know, uh, especially when I, uh, I'm written already, yeah? Then all of a sudden I realize, look, uh, for example, uh, the railway or the step, for example, was in his, uh, this novel, the Kazakh family was in this novel, the orphanage or orphans, where in his uh, the Billy Parachot, for example. So wherever I go, he has already been kind of, you know, in Central Asian novels, mm. kind of. But at the same time, there is enough of space to uh, other people to come to the same places and to uh, get the different results. Thank you. That's, that's a wonderful answer that I think in in so many ways seems to me to resonate with your, your work more broadly. This, both this kind of interest in evading being fixed into firm categories, um, constantly moving between uh, different forms of experience, different languages, different places, but also that awareness of the, of the power of the past and of, of cultural tradition to actually shape the way that we, we experience any one particular place, right? And it's really that the tension between those two things that I think so much of your writing brings so vividly to the fore. Um, perhaps this is a good moment. Uh, if Agnes Harsha and Sophie have any final comments or thoughts they want to share, um, perhaps this is a good moment for us simply to, to thank um, our guest, Hamid Ismailov, who is um, bravely <laughs> adapted to our slightly changed format for today. Um, and conducted this um, this event uh, wonderfully uh, and richly from his from his hotel room. Um, so I want to thank uh, Hamid Ismailov very much for joining us today. We're very grateful and very honoured to have been able to host him here at Berkeley. Um, thank you to Harsha and Sophie for also being part of the event, um, and thank you to everyone uh, who's been watching. Um, and I think we'll we'll wrap it up there for today. So thanks for all very much for joining. Can I join to thank everyone who took part in this, who organized this, and hosts as well. Thank you very much indeed. I really appreciate uh, your participation in today's evening. Thank you, Amit. It was our pleasure. Okay. <laughs>